the Lord. And we are certainly sorry that we don't have seats to accommodate the people and to those who are, are turned away to the outside. I just heard a few moments ago where we could have got a theater in New Albany that would have perhaps taken care of about 3,000 people, but we just was just the revival as far as just the little group here at the church, and, and we're just a little homecoming time. And we're very happy to see you all in. If I'm not mistaken, I see my Georgia brother here, brother, um, I can't call your name, just then. Palmer from Macon, Georgia. We're glad to have you here, Brother Palmer. Brother Creech here at the front, we're glad to see you. And I know that somewhere in the building is Dr. Lee Vale, one of the sponsors of the of the meeting at Lima, Ohio, with, uh, he's a pastor of the First Baptist Church, and um, a personal friend of mine who is up home today and has come to visit with us through the meeting. We are probably, one of the nights, we will have him to get up and say something. I tried to get him to take my place tonight to speak, and he uh, refused it. So uh, we hope maybe that maybe tomorrow night or sometime Brother Vale or some of us will be able to say a word or two concerning maybe the meeting or something up there or whatever the Lord puts on his heart. There's others here that I wish I could just take the time to recognize them all, but we're happy for you to be here. I see one little fellow back here who is a group of ministers that comes, uh, was visiting with me this afternoon from over in Arkansas and also from Missouri. Now, tonight we want to redeem the time because each night we're going to try to be finished by 9 o'clock, if possible. Tonight is communion night, so it'll be just a little later tonight than usual. <clears throat> Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I want to preach on Be Ye Therefore Perfect and the Perfect Sacrifice. Tomorrow night. And then that's Good Friday. And then on Saturday night, the entombment, if the Lord willing, Sunday morning sunrise service at 6 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, uh, baptismal service and 10.30 the Sunday school lesson of the resurrection and Sunday night a regular healing service like we have out in the in the evangelistic field so now we're trusting that you'll get the sinner friends and so forth and come be with us and help us in this uh, meeting this coming uh, continuation of this meeting really. I got a new Bible tonight that was given to me by some a Dunkard brother, and it's kind of a big thing, and it's the first time I've ever preached out of it, it's a little awkward to me. Now, I know that we have met for one purpose, that is to, to further the cause of Christ and to find peace in our souls and to make us better men and women, better servants of the Lord. And if we come for any other idea, why then we will not be blessed of the Lord. We've come for help. We've come looking to God, and this is a house of correction, where God gives us of his blessings and corrects us from the wrong. Now, just before we open the word, or, or ask the Holy Spirit to help us, let us bow our heads. Blessed Heavenly Father, into thy divine presence we present ourselves now as listeners to the gospel and as speakers of the word, circumcised lips that speak and ears that hear and hearts that receive. And may the Holy Spirit divide to us tonight and impart the truth of God's eternal grace to every one of us. That when we leave this building tonight, we'll say like those who coming from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us because he talked to us along the road. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Over in the book of St. Matthew's Gospel, in the 26th chapter, the 27th and 28th verse, for a text I wish to read. And he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, and he gave it 
to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And now we're going to speak on the communion. And this is the original communion night. And communion was held first way down in Egypt. The first of the communion, which was the, the Passover lamb that was slain, which was the type of Christ. Many of us are familiar with that blessed old story of how that they who took the communion down there walked through the wilderness for 40 years. And when they come out, there wasn't a feeble one among them. And their, even their clothes was not even threadbare. For 40 years, God had kept them. What a blessed assurance it is to us tonight. If that be the type, then Christ is the antitype. And how did God deliver the children? And in the taking of the communion was the difference between life and death. Those who were on the inside under the shed blood took the communion. No one could take the communion outside being under the shed blood. The blood of the Lamb was shed first and then was put on the lintel and the doorpost. The lintel is the cross timber and on the doorpost. And then the Lamb was roasted and was and, and was eaten with bitter herbs, and they girded themselves after the blood was shed and had passed under the shed blood. They were girded and ready for the march. Amen. And uh, it's a very beautiful type tonight of people who take communion is not to be associated or affiliated with things of the world anymore. They must come under the blood first and be cleansed from all sin, which is unbelief, and then be shod with the preparation of the gospel, Amen. having all the whole armor of God ready for the summons at any time. Amen. And it was the, the sign that the death angel could not go beneath that blood. The death angel had to rise and go over the blood. Amen. And that's where the poet got the inspiration saying, When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. It was near the hour of deliverance when they accepted the communion, the, the roasted lamb and the, the herbs that they'd taken before leaving. Now, in the antitype that we're to speak of, it was many years ago tonight that Jesus taken what we know as the Lord's Supper, the communion. And there's something about it that he was going to talk to his disciples and just before going away, he wanted to talk it over with them. And it's a, they had a room prepared. It was a time of fellowship, and the communion does mean a fellowship. Many of the churches have closed communion. That is just to their own church when they have the communion. But here we are not a denomination. We have an open communion for all. For we believe that every believer has a right to the table of the Lord and a fellowship around the good things of God with every believer, regardless of creed, color, or whatever he may be, that all have been made drink of the self-same blessing, Christ. Now, this great hour had approached our Lord one of the most trying times 
of all of this earthly journey was just at hand, testing time. Jesus had to go through testing just as we go through testing. And the Bible said that every son that cometh to God must first be tested, trained, corrected. How many people, it is a showdown when the testing time comes. It's a time of a proving place. And the Bible said, if we cannot stand the testing, then we become illegitimate children. We are professing God to be our Father, and then He is not our Father. For if we have correctly and with all of our heart received the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, there is nothing in this earth or in all dark eternity can, can ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I'm astounded in this day, and I've always been, when people profess to be Christians, and the first little trial comes on, they fall by the wayside. It goes to show that it was an intellectual conception of Christ. That's the reason so many doesn't hold out today, is because it's an intellectual conception. Intellectually, you could believe it, but it goes further than that. To accept Christ is to accept the person of Christ. Many of us accept religion of Christianity upon the learning of creeds. Others accept Christianity upon doctrines of baptism. Others believe that they are Christians because of some emotion that they have exercised, such as shouting or dancing in the Spirit or speaking with tongues or having some marvelous gift to present. All those things are good in their place. But to accept Christ is to accept the person of Christ. If then these other things just automatically fall in line. Now, if God did not spare His own Son from the cruel testing, then He will not spare you or I from the cruel testing. And Jesus was here confronting the greatest test that he had ever had, Gethsemane, laid just before him, where that once and final, all-sufficient test must come. When the burdens of the entire world laid up on his blessed shoulders, there was no one in all heavens or earth could ever stood it but Him. Amen. And to know that all of the sins of past sins and present sins and future sins rested upon this decision. And it was one of the most greatest victories that Christ every one of proved. His great messiahship is when he said to God, Not my will, thine be done. Yeah. That was the greatest victory he had ever won. All the demons of torment was around to tempt him and try him. And when we get right with God, when our hearts become pure and the Holy Spirit has taken its place in our hearts. It's the most glorious thing to have testing. Amen. The Bible tells us that our testings and trials are more precious to us than silver and gold of this world. Amen. So we are, should be thankful. I do not wish to bring my own self into some experience but just as it comes on my mind, 
I remember the great and final test that I had of my Christian experience. It was yonder in the hospital out here on Spring Hill when my wife was laying in the moor down here a corpse and she had just moved out of this life to be with God and the testings and trials was on. Not just someone saying, Billy, you're holy roller. That was my testing. And these other little trials and so forth of criticism from the man that I work with, it wasn't much testing. But my great hour of testing comes when the doctor, a dare that I rehearsed it to him yesterday in the hospital when we sat together, and when he come down the hall to meet me and took me by the hand and said, Billy, your baby is dying. And there's not a chance for it to live. It's got two burglar meningitis. I said, surely not, doctor. And his mother laying a car. And I go in. He said, just come with me. And we went to the laboratory. And there he picked up a little glass tube. And he shook it. And there seemed to be a streak in it. He said, that is the meningitis germ. And it's in the baby. We drew this from the spine to release the spasm. And he said, in this we find that it's tuberculous meningitis. Said it nursed it from its mother. And said, if that baby should live, it would be crippled, afflicted. But he said, by the mercies of God, the baby is going to be with its mother. I said, Doctor, I want to see the baby. He said, you can't do it, Billy, because of Billy Paul, your boy. said, you would pack the germ back to him. And after trying to encourage me the best that he knew how, when he left the building, I slipped around and went down into the basement. And when I got there, the hospital at that time wasn't fixed as it is now. And the window was up and the screen was out and some flies that got into the little fellow's eyes. And I shooed the flies away and looked down at her little body all drawn in her little legs moving back and forth. And I said to her, Sherry, honey, do you know Daddy? And it seemed like that she was trying to wave her little hand to me, about eight or nine months old. And I looked at her, and she was suffering so hard, a little innocent baby, until one of her little baby blue eyes crossed. So much pain. Oh, I would have took it at any time in her stead. And I knelt down on my knees with the doors closed and I said, Oh, God, Father, there lays my wife, the baby's mother, laying yonder in the undertaker's morgue. There's Billy Paul on the bed sick and here's my baby dying. You surely, Lord, won't take her. I love her. And she resembles her mother. I want to raise her. Won't you please, oh God, spare my baby's life? And as I looked up, and as you all know, I've always been subject to vision. It seemed like a black sheet began to unfold, coming down. And as if God took my prayer and threw it right back in my face. I said, what have I done, God? Have I transgressed your laws that I should have this punishment? If it is, you just reveal it and I'll repent. I'll do anything, but don't take my baby. And I seen she was going anyhow. I raised up and then the tempter came to me. There was 
It's the one time in all my life that I can call was the crucial moment, my Gethsemane, when I was just barely holding to the bed. The devil said, there you are. That's the reward for trying to serve him. You mean that he'll take that young 22-year-old mother and lay her yonder as a corpse in the morgue and will take the precious baby, your own flesh and blood, and slam your prayer right in your face? And then you mean to say that you'll serve him? I was standing between opinions. It had to be decided. Then I put my hand over on her little head. I said, the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I felt relief. I said, Sherry, honey, Daddy cannot go where you are now, but Daddy can come someday. I'll lay you on the arm of Mother and bear you, but Daddy will see you again someday. Ever. Mr. Eisler, who's probably sitting present now, I can't see through the crowd, the ex-state senator here of Indiana, I was going up the highway, Mr. Eisler, I guess you can well remember. I had my hands behind me going up to the graveyard right after the flood, weeping. I used to go up there, and in the evening an old turtle dove would sit over in the tree and would sing to me and seem like down through the breezes of those pines and trees seemed like a song would whisper through it, saying, There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet part ever. Amen. We only reach that shore by faith degree. One by one we gain the portal there to dwell with the immortal. Someday they'll ring those golden bells for you and me. Mr. Eisler, driving his old truck, jumped out and put his arm around me and said, I've heard you preaching on the street corner, Billy. I've seen you standing in the tabernacle. I've heard you at the hymn singing how you exalted Christ. What you said he was. So now he has taken your father, your brother, your wife, and your baby. So now what does he mean to you? I said, Mr. Eiser, if he would send me to the regions of the law, I'd still love him. For one day down yonder, on an old coal shed, something happened down here in my heart that there is nothing that can rub it out. It was nothing that I did. It was God's eternal grace that helped me in the hours of great decision. And when our blessed Lord in the Gethsemane went going there when he was re to be rejected at Jerusalem and the council was going to take his life, when the eternal destination of every soul that ever was or would be on the earth rested upon his decision. Oh, how little mine was in comparison to that. How little yours was in comparison to that. Such a pity that we can't stand these little things. But in that great crucial hour, until he suffered, knowing all things, until the water and blood separated in his body and great drops of sweat like blood dropped from his brow. He died more death in Gethsemane than he did on the cross. He was just at the event of this, just before the great battle was to start, and he touched the communion. He brought his disciples together to talk over things with them. And that's the way he does you and I. Just before the great battle of life starts, before the great battle of right
right and wrong begins to battle within us, God brings us to a Gethsemane. He brings us to the communion. And He talks it all over with us. Way out in Phoenix, Arizona, there used to be a little creole that used to sing for me. I would like to talk it over with Jesus. I like to say, Jesus, you love me when my path got so near. When it was so dim that I could see, oh, Father, you love me when it was dim. Amen. And the little song goes on to say, well, I like to talk it over. And it's a good thing that men and women of this earth stop in lifelong travel and talk it over with Jesus. Amen. Have communion with Him in a fellowship. Then the battle begins of the testing and the trying. Every son that cometh to God must be tested. Now, the communion is not a, is not given for the purpose that many people think it is. It's taught, taught by a certain denomination of church that communion is called the last rite. That it pertains to salvation. Communion does not pertain to salvation. Communion does not give you salvation. Whether you take it in your death or, or what, it does not have nothing to do with your salvation. It is a commemoration. Amen. Jesus said in the gospel, he said, this do in remembrance of me. Amen. Not it leading or pointing to salvation, but it's in commemoration of a finished work Amen. that's been done in you Amen. by the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a commemoration. Now there's many that take the communion is not saved. Many eat the Paschal Lamb and perish in the wilderness. And many take the communion today that will never see God. But you cannot be a partaker of His salvation and not see Him because salvation is the gift of God. And communion is commemoration of the great, all-sufficient sacrifice that was made for that salvation. Amen. It's to let people see that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represents the finished work. Salvation once was not completed. In the offering of the goats, the sheep, the heifers, in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament blood could not atone for sin. It could only cover sin. It was a pointing to a time when it would be completed. Tomorrow night we're to get right in on that. But it was only a type. But when Jesus came and His blood was shed at Calvary... It was a complete divorcing of sin. It taken sin away. It's the only means of salvation. Amen. There is no church joining, no letters of fellowship. There is no ritual baptism. There's no communion or nothing in the ritual or any article that's been left of God as articles pertain to salvation. It's all in commemoration of a finished work. Amen. Amen. Water baptism does not save you. As much as people sometimes think it does, water baptism is a commemoration of the death Burial and resurrection of the law. Amen. It does not save you. Praise Communion is in commemoration of his great agony and his going out in his broken body and his blood that was shed. It is not the literal blood. It is not the 
literal body, but it's in commemoration of his literal body and of his precious blood. And we take this as an uh, order, and Jesus commanded us to do it. As long as he stays away, we are to take it. Amen. We have a great, beautiful picture over in the book of the Hebrew letter. In the seventh chapter, I would like to read just a little place in Hebrews 7 to get a context to go with this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness, after that the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Notice, we want to go back and think Paul here is referring back to an Old Testament character. In the book of Genesis, we take up the life of Abraham from the 12th chapter of Genesis. God giving uh, Abraham the promise, and through Abraham would come the righteous seed. And Abraham, as believed by many to be a Jew, he was not. Abraham was a Gentile, a Chaldean from the city of Ira. And he became God's servant, not because he was different from anyone else, but because of the election of God. You are not saved because you are a good person. You are saved because Christ chose you. No man seeks God. God seeks man. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And if we could stop just for a few moments and realize the great importance of that one thing, that it was God who chose you, not willing that you should perish, but give to you the opportunity and called you and elected you to be his servant. Well, what could be more precious than that? Amen. Without you having a choice, it would be total impossible for any man to seek God. For he by nature is a sinner. And he has nothing within him to give a desire to serve God. Could you go to the pig and tell him he's wrong? He's a pig by nature. Could you tell him his diet is wrong? Certainly not. By nature he is a pig. You should tell him he'd be a lamb. But he's satisfied as a pig. And a sinner is satisfied as a sinner because his nature is a sinner. And here it is. We are all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. By nature, a child of disobedience. Without God, without hope, the wrath of God abiding on us. Amen. And by the loving grace of Christ, Amen. God in His sovereign grace and His omnipotence knocks at your heart and gives you the blessed opportunity and courage Amen. and sets you up the road. Amen. How could you turn that down? Amen. Changes your whole desire. Amen. Turns you around Amen. and starts you the other way. Oh, you'll be silly to the world, but you'll be blessed in the sight of God. 
left in our days and do hunger and thirst for righteousness. And for they shall be filled. Said our Lord Jesus Christ. God, by His amazing grace, notice it was what God did, what God called. You had no will to call. You could have no desire to call because your nature was completely contrary to it. But God, by election, called you and turned you around and set your affections towards Christ and the things of us. How could we turn it down? Then God showed in Abraham what he would do for all. Not only was this blessed promise of the resurrection and eternal life given to Abraham, but to his seed after him. The call, the elected of God. And we notice that Abraham, out in the fields where he was sojourning, his brother, he called it, Lot. It was really his nephew, his brother's son. And the time come for the testing, and Lot weakened under the testing. He is a perfect picture of the carnal believer today. Amen. When the Amen. testing comes to stay on the barren land, Abraham gave him his choice. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the fields, the valleys. And it was full of grass. It was also full of fine homes. It was full of gaiety. It was also full of sin. But Lot, being of the carnal nature, loving this present world more than the things to come, chose rather to live luxurious in this life than to have life hereafter. Amen. Abraham, a perfect type of the true believer who's been washed in the blood of the Lamb, whose affections are set on things above, said, I'll take the way with the Lord defied you, regardless if it costs my popularity, whatever it costs, I'll take the way with the Lord you. And he chose to stay in the land where God placed him under the testing time. Amen. I wonder tonight if I'm speaking to people who once made a start to go through with God. And when the testing time comes, you chose rather to go back into the world and do the things of the world, or did you take the rugged old way of salvation? Did you do like Moses when he was under testing? When he had his foot on the throne of Egypt, but he esteemed the riches of Christ. Amen. Greater treasure than all the riches of Egypt. He forsook Egypt, did not care how much gold, how many poplars. He took God at his word and forsook the things of Egypt. Having the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. What do we do under the testing? When the hard trials come, when they say because that you separate yourself, from the things of the world, that you're a religious fanatic. Does the strain come? It's got to come. And you've got to make the choice. But I'd rather abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'd rather take my way in like Jacob has a pillow of stone. I'd rather be considered by the world a crank than to have all the riches and blessings that this world could afford to give. Because greater is the blessings of God than all the riches and gold and silver of this world. Now, 
Notice, then, when the great testings come, Lot went down into sin. Remember, he went from the mountain down into the plain. He backslid. Yeah. Like the a perfect representative of carnal Christianity today, so called. Choosing rather to take the road of ease, the far bed of ease, than to stand true in the time of trial. Right. And he finally got in trouble. And you will too. Yeah. When you choose that better bed of ease, remember you are going to get in trouble. Yeah. Something your sins will find you out. And God will catch up with you someday. And one day the kings, the Gentile kings of the great regions away, came in and took Lot and his children, his wife, and all that he had, and escaped with them. And someday, my frail friend, if you don't stay under the blood, the kingdoms of Satan will overtake you and carry you away Abraham. if you don't stay under the blood. And Abraham, a type of the just, he was so concerned about his nephew, a representative of the real true Christian that's tested and tried and been proven. Now, the women had a lot to do with it. Lot's wife was carnal, very carnal. She stands today in the fields there as a pillar of salt, as a disgrace to those who pass by. Sarah, a beautiful woman, she wanted to do what God wanted her to do. She respected her husband, as we spoke so definitely on that last evening. And she stayed with Abraham. Regardless of what come or went, she stayed with him because he stayed with the promise. That's the thing. Then when Lot was packed away, Abraham's heart went for him. And he gathered an army of his own servants and went after his brother. And a very beautiful type. They took their swords and chopped those kings down till there was not one of them left. And that's the type of the gospel preacher. When he sees that sin has caught his church and caught the people, he takes the blessed old gospel, the sword of the Spirit, and he chops it and chops it Amen. until he cuts out sin from his church. If he's a true servant of God, he removes all the nonsense, the tad and the backbiting. He removes all of the things and carnal natures of the world that's creeped into the church. If he's a true servant of God, he takes the word and chops it from one side to the other until he's cut everything out. And then when he has got lost, his backslidden brother and the children, and he was bringing them back to reconciliation. Amen. Notice, this great king comes down from Jerusalem. Oh, and then, Melchizedek, what type of man was that? He was called the king of Salem, which any scholar knows that Salem was Jerusalem. It was called Salem before it was called Jerusalem. Who was this man that met him that thought he had taken the right step? Who was this person that stood by him? Watch who he is. He is the king of Jerusalem. And he's also the king of peace. Third verse, without father, without mother, without descent, without beginning of days, or without ending of life. Who was this great? 
great prince. That name, after the battle was over. Let's turn over to Genesis, the 14th verse, the 14th chapter, and the 18th verse. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Blessed, and said, Blessed be the most high God, preserver of heavens and earth. And blessed be Abraham, who is his servant. After the battle was over, after the victory was won, after the clearance had been made, Melchizedek met Abraham on the plain and brought bread and wine. And heard it to him. And who no other was that than the one that made Abraham about a year later sat under the tree and talked to him. And this same Melchizedek said, I will take no more of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom after the battle is over. When the victory is won, then we'll take it anew in his kingdom. When the last battle is fought, when the last sword has killed the last evil of the world, and the great church of the living God triumphs, Christ will beat them in the air with the prayer of the wine of the air, the communion, and for eternity in the presence of the Father. O weary pilgrim tonight, come back to the Father's house. Come up out of Sodom. You've been reconciled by the blood. And this glorious memorial night, when our great Melchizedek, who had no beginning of days or ending of life, but is a king and a prince forever and forever, Amen. the Holy Spirit here tonight is a wooing to the unseen. Now, if you're without Christ tonight, and when the battle is over, if you want to meet him in peace and take the communion with him, and you promise that you love him, and separate yourself from the things of the world. Amen. Take the old rugged gospel Amen. in the old-fashioned rugged Amen. way and drink the cup of the bitterness of the persecution of the world and drinking the bitter drugs of persecution of the world it's given to us by the Bible that we'll drink the sweet wines of heaven Amen. someday when we meet him in peace down earth between the heavens and earth when he comes to serve the communion. May our hearts think this over. I'll drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. If he should come before another Easter comes, if you should die before another Easter comes, it will not prevent that great event. For I say by the word of the Lord that those which are sleeping in Christ shall come forth first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them together in the air to meet the Lord. Amen. And the great Melchizedek of heaven, the king of not the natural Jerusalem, but the king of the heavenly Jerusalem, Amen. the new Jerusalem, will meet us and we'll be served again the wine and the bread. Amen. Tonight we are to take the symbols of this. We are to do it till we find Him coming again. May we be found faithful as we bow our heads just a moment for a word of prayer. Everyone just as quiet as possible. In this most solemn, holy moment, how easy is it to let these things slip? The Bible said, let's we should let those things slip and neglect such a great salvation. It's so easy to forget it. 
We do not come to church to be seen. We do not come to hear good singing or a good sermon. We come to church to worship, to worship God. And each one of us are mortal beings that's got a soul that's got to meet Him someday. And on the eve of this great crucifixion day, in commemoration of His going away, tonight, if you're not a Christian, have never accepted Christ in your life as Savior, are you convinced enough by the preaching of the Word and is the Holy Spirit standing near you to say you're guilty? Now turn and start the other way. Would you declare the same by raising up your hand saying, Brother Branham, pray for me. I now solicit your prayers that God will be merciful to me. Would you raise your hand while we're waiting? God bless you, sir. Someone else, God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, little one. God bless you. With someone, God bless you, lady. You say, Brother Branham, does that mean anything to raise my hand? Yes, the difference between death and life. What's any greater than life? You love. You look at nature. You love it. You hate to go away from it. Just across the street here when my brother wife was dying one morning many years ago when poor little Ruth raised up her head and there's a robin sitting in a cherry tree and she wanted to see it one more time how she loved nature but someday when Jesus comes she'll hear the birds of eternity singing the flowers in marble will be growing There will be no sickness, sorrow, or death because she made her peace with God and accepted the great Christ who died for her with this blessed assurance who cannot fail, the blessed Word of God who cannot lie, promise eternal life to those who believe. When you raise your hand, it shows that a spirit inside of you has made a decision. God bless you, lady. Something in you, a, a spirit, by nature your arms is made to hang down. And when you raise your hand, you defy the very laws of gravitation. It has to be supernatural. It's, a, it's against sign, scientific against all scientific things for you to break the laws of gravitation. It cannot be done unless there is something supernatural. Your arms would continually hang down. But if in your heart you believe the gospel story and have made your decision this night that you're through with sin and on this beautiful approach to Calvary, when tomorrow at three o'clock in commemoration we celebrate the day when Jesus died for your salvation. And you think enough of it, and the Holy Spirit has come and knocked at your heart, and you've now accepted it. You just, something in your heart says, raise your hand, that shows to the people and to God that you believe it and accept it. God bless you. All you little children, three or four of them here on the altar, little boys and girls about eight, ten years old, they all put up their hands at one time. Jesus said, Suffer little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom. Is there another before we pray? God bless you, lady. That's a real... You might have done many things, lady, in life that was real. I believe you to be a, an honest woman. And remember, you could not have put up your hand, sister dear, unless something inside you, something way down in you said, do that. It may seem just a little foolish now to the carnal mind, but brother, on that day when the doctor walks away from the door and says, it's finished, when he goes away from that wreck and pulls that little body of yours out, the blood's 
going away and your heart's a painting. There's no need of fooling with them. They're gone. Oh, my. And frantically and wild, you'll try to repent and God said in your calamities, I can only laugh. But while you're sane in your right mind, Father, as we bring this message to the close and a harvest of about 15 people raising their hands that's been sinners all their lives and now by grace you have spoke to them turn them right around and let them face Calvary and hearing them words come from the lips of the Son of God Father forgive them they didn't know what they were doing but tonight they have received the gospel. We hear him say a few days prior of this, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment but pass from death to life. We present them to thee tonight, Lord, as thy children. May thy eternal blessings rest upon them. In Christ's name we pray. May they come Sunday morning packing their clothes saying I desire to make a public confession to this world that I am a believer. I am now desiring to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ calling upon Him to fill me with the Holy Spirit and care for me through life. Bless these young women, these young men, the aged, the little children and all. Care for them, Father. They are yours. And in the fruits of this message tonight, I present them to you as the attributes. And they are in your hand as love gifts from God the Father. I pray that you will care for them through life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are very happy to have you here tonight, and we are glad that you come. And tomorrow night, our message is tomorrow night on the perfection of the believer. And now come, bring someone with you if your own church doesn't have services. And now we are going to have the communion. Maybe some of you, I'm just a, a little teeny bit late, a few minutes, and we're going to dismiss those who have to go. And those who wish to stay to take the communion and foot washing with us. We believe in absolutely doing every article that Jesus left for us to do. And if he shall come in my generation and will let me stay in my right mind and keep his love in my heart, I'll be trying my best to do every one of them and be found faithful at the post. God bless you now.